Thank you for watching this talk, which is part of the online workshop for your Restriction Online 2021. My name is A.V. Paulson, and I'm a harmonic analyst at Virginia Tech. I'm going to tell you today about geometric averaging operators motivated by point configurations. So let's dive right in and start with a very classical uh, geometric averaging operator, namely the spherical averaging operator. What it does is that it takes in a function and replaces the function at a point x by its average over a unit sphere around said point. Now if you think about it then, averages tend to make things better, so you would somehow imagine that this object here is at least as good as the object that you began with, namely the function f. This type of an object arises naturally when you just write down the solutions to the wave equation, but also has applications into ergodic theorems and whatnot. Now, based on this initial sort of idea that, well, averages just make things better, then it's absolutely trivial that this operator maps LP to LP for any P bigger or equal to one. Uh, just interchange the order of integration. However, if you move to the Fourier site, then one of the observations is that this operator really is a convolution operator. You're really convolving the function f with this natural measure. And the Fourier transform changes convolution to multiplication. So you can see on the Fourier site that this operator really is given uh, by a symbol. The symbol, which is the Fourier transform of the natural measure on the sphere. Now, if you hope to see any improving properties of this operator, well, then they should come from the fact that this symbol that you're working with, this Fourier multiplier, is somehow better than just being, say, one. And that is indeed the case. The classic calculation using stationary phase shows that this Fourier transform of the natural measure on the sphere decays. It decays like d minus one over two out at infinity. And obviously it's bounded at the origin. And through this, one can establish a lot of wonderful properties. For example, one can show LP improving properties. That is, uh, this operator maps LP into LQ if and only if the coefficients sit in, within a certain triangle. What really this encodes, 0, 0 here encodes the L infinity to L infinity estimate, and 1, 1 encodes the L1 to L and L1 estimates. And by interpolation, you get all the ones in between. Those are the trivial estimates. So really the content of the statement is this extra point here. And what it says is that your operator, for example, maps L D plus 1 over D, uh, which is you know, between one and two, maps not only into itself, but maps into any LP space all the way up to LD plus one, which is a whole range of LP spaces. And this is an example of an LP improving operator. Uh, one can also see this through Sobel of bounds, uh, just from the decay of the simple here. Well, if you think about it, if you were to take derivatives of this operator, then on the Fourier site, they really are just multiplication by xi, and then you can see that you can sort of roughly cancel things out. So it's very natural that it maps L2 into L2 with d minus one over two derivatives. That is, you go into a Sobel of space. That is, not only is the output in L2, but you can take d minus one over two derivatives and still be in L2. And these results here, classic results uh, attributed to Littmann and Struckerts. One can also consider the maximal variant of this operator. Now what you do here is that you do not average just over a unit sphere. What you do is you look at averages over all possible spheres of all possible radii, and you'd sort of take the worst one in the limit. Now it's not as obvious what's gonna happen here because on the one hand, averages do tend to make things better. On the other hand, you are taking the worst sphere. So somehow you could always go into whatever regions where the function is really large, so it's unclear. Uh, monumental work by Stein in dimension three and Borgian in dimension two showed that this operator maps LP to LP, but only if P is above a certain threshold, D over D minus one. Uh, Borgian also showed some endpoint results, and there's a, another proof, uh, very different by Mokunov, Sager, and Sock, connects to local smoothing that is also very influential. Um, 
but boundedness fails below this threshold. Now, for applications, then, for example, this is a classic example in many graduate real analysis classes or measure theory classes. You use this boundedness type statements to prove uh, Lebesgue differentiation type theorems. That is, uh, if you average over a sphere, then and take a limit as your radius is shrinking, you get the value at the center for almost every x. And this, of course, parallels the Lebesgue differentiation type theorem. It, it, it's a theorem of a similar type, but here you can only do it if you're picking a function that is an LP space with p good enough. So complete parallels here. Now, in terms of ideas, then one can roughly restrict the, the radius down to sitting in an interval, say one to two, uh, or it, some of the major difficulties boil down to that. And then what one can prove is that if you perform a little Paley decomposition on the function f, that is you break it up in terms of the size of the Fourier frequencies of the function, then near L1, which here I'm thinking of Q being near L1, you prove estimates for this operator with quite a bit of loss. Whereas on L2, where you get access to the decay of the uh, natural measure in the sphere, you report a gain. And you can interpolate between these two bounds, get estimates that go down towards L1, that's where this threshold d for d minus 1 sort of comes from roughly. And then you can interpolate, of course, with the trivial estimates at L infinity to get a wide range of estimates. Um, I will point out here that, of course, this gain here is only if d is large enough, that is, d is bigger equal to 3. And this is, of course, one of the monumental difficulties that Bourgeon and then later um, Malkin out saw and Saver faced when uh, extending the results into dimension 2. They, because they couldn't use this simple scheme. Now, in terms of some recent work, then not only can you restrict, say, the radius to the interval 1 to 2, what one can look at more generically what happens if you restrict the radius uh, to some other type of a set, maybe not a full interval, maybe it's something fractal or whatnot. Uh, and there are some recent really cool results on that by Anderson, Hughes, and Roos and Sager, as well as Roos and Sager following up, where they quantify what kind of dimensional statements, for example, uh, on E can lead to boundedness statements for this operator and what kind of gain you have. There's some classic results that if your sets are somehow thin enough, maybe you take just dyadic maximal operators, you get better results than I showed you on the previous slides. And so, so these tie into that tie in some classic results with what I just showed you. Um, and there's some surprising uh, objects that arise. It's not just your classic dimensional uh, statements that you would use here. Um, there are some novel uh, things that arise. This also connects to some recent programs in sparse domination that, among other things, have applications to the sort of maximal uh, linear radon transforms, which include the maximal spherical averaging operator. And these are worked by Beltran, Ruiz, Sager, as well as Conde Alonso, Diplinio, Perisis, and Lampati. Now, I mentioned sort of in the beginning that the spherical averaging operator is a convolution operator. And one of the most classic convolution inequalities you can work with is Young's inequality. Now, one usage of it is, is that one can apply it to linear convolution operators where you convolve a function with a kernel. And, and of course, here you can think um, if you're convolving with a measure, then you could just smooth out your measure and then and, and, and create a family of estimates on objects of this type. Now, I mention this because I'm interested in multilinear analogs of these sort of classic linear objects. And a very classical multilinear object is taking, is sort of written down here. And the viewpoint of it really is that it's a tensor product of functions that is convolved with generically a kernel. Of course, the kernel could break down into many little parts. So this is not as simplistic, but, but generically it could 
think of writing a multilinear object as tensor product convolved with a kernel. Now, this idea of studying these types of operators is not new at all. And in fact, Dan Oberlin in 88, and putting the year here just to point out that this has been around for a while, established in fact a young type equality for an operator of this type. Now, if we wanted to look at multilinear analogs of the spherical averaging operator, then maybe a first thing you would think of is take a tensor product of functions and, con and convolve with uh, uh, a product of uh, spherical measures. Uh, this object is somewhat simplistic because it can is it, it simply breaks down into just multiplication of operators so lp bounds and lp improving bounds just simply come from using holder a number of times um, one can however get some interesting statements about these types of operators in fact sparse and weighted bounds that are non-trivial have been obtained by ron conscious and schuman and so so this it definitely is one idea of stating a multilinear spherical averaging operator. However, I don't want to go in this direction uh, because I'm interested in LP and LP improving bounds and so forth. Um, so I'm going to look at what I view as the most natural multilinear spherical averaging operator, which is simply taking the viewpoint of tensor product of functions and then just convolve with a single spherical measure for just a sphere that lives in very high dimensional space potentially. And of course, you can look at a maximal analog of this, uh, where you just take a supremum in the radius uh, that you can sort of plug in here along the way. Now, this object is not new. Again, Dan Oberlin, one of the reasons he studied his Young's inequality was in order to apply it to operators of this type. Uh, he studied the particular case where d is 1, so the input in each of the functions is one dimensional, just a real number. However, the sphere itself lives in n dimensions. And he established a wide range of estimates for these types of operators. I will say though that the restriction of d being equal to one sort of kills a little bit the geometry with inside each of the functions. And it is actually an interesting funny story that I bumped into this operator with my collaborators, Dan Jeppa, Alan Greenleaf, Alex Yosevich, and Eric Sawyer. Um, our purpose for our paper uh, were bounds for multilinear geometric averaging operators, more in line with what I will show you later in the talk. But we took in a single location an example of this type of a multilinear spherical averaging operator. We didn't even know about Dan Oberlin's result at the time and stated an LP uh, LP mapping properties for such operators. These are fairly restrictive. Uh, they're not anywhere near as interesting as what Dan Oberlin did, but we were able to handle the case uh, of the dimension being two and higher. So really the geometry was starting to kick in and there are some uh, differences and different techniques that you have to handle in that case. Now, what was interesting is that this started a cascade of uh, work where many authors uh, improved vastly on our results. Uh, and let me show you some of these results. So the first improvement was by Per Nuevo, Krafakos, He, Hosnik, and Oliveira. He is one of the speakers at this online workshop. Um, they pushed our result into a much wider range that I'm trying to map out here with my mouse uh, in dimensions eight and higher. Whereas we had been on a, basically in a single line, roughly in this picture. So much broader range of estimates. And this was improved by a subset of those authors, Grafakos, He, and Honsek, where they uh, improved the dimensional threshold down to four. Um, their techniques was, were very Fourier and analytic in, nature. They were really using the uh, Fourier decay of the simple, cutting it up very intricately. And so one could state analogous theorems for any kind of a symbol that has similar kind of decay. They were not really using the fact that the underlying object was a sphere. It was just a Fourier decay that was being used. Now the next set of off 
authors Hyo Hong and Yang used the fact that uh, slightly that it was a sphere. They used more uh, delicate uh, series sort of representations for the Fourier transform of the natural symbol on the sphere and were able to boost the results that we saw in the previous slide into this larger regime but still sticking to the dimensional threshold of d being bigger or equal to 4. So slightly more information, geometric information, started to make its way into the proofs. But then this problem was completely resolved up to, say, some endpoints possibly by Yong and Li. They obtained results, note here dimension d bigger equal to 2, and they got the full possible range that you could hope for. And the thresholds here that you see, the d minus 1 over d, really come from the one-dimensional analogs, and since they are sharp, we expect them. Then these results over here are also sharp. You can't push beyond sort of the best thing you can do in the linear world, in some sense. Uh, and just to show you how much they use the structure of the operator, and their argument is, in fact, quite simple. All they did was that they took the the spherical measure and really wrote it out as an iterative uh, measure in some sense. What it allowed them to do was it allowed them to isolate in here in the inner integral a spherical average. And yes, the radius seems pretty bad, but you can dominate this with the spherical maximal operator. And what is left then is an average of the function over a ball. And yes, there's a nuisance term here, but it can be dominated and really can dominate this whole thing by a hardy low of maximal operator. So really can dominate the original operator by a product of a spherical maximal operator and hardy low of maximal operator. And this gives you the full range automatically, really simple. Now, I want to switch gears here very briefly and just tell you quickly about two uh, point configuration questions. I'm going to start with the Erdős distinct distance problem. Erdős asked, what's the least number of distinct distances determined by endpoints in the plane? And just to give you some context, why least number? Why not most number or something along those lines? Well, if you throw endpoints randomly down in the plane, then the number of distances you can measure is n choose 2, which is roughly on the order of n squared, and you can achieve it by just throwing the points randomly. So an upper bound is really easy to achieve and prove, and so the real interesting question is how low can you go? Now motivated by the integer lattice, Erdős uh, conjectured that you ought not to be able to go lower than n over square root of log n, asymptotically as n is going to infinity, which is exactly what happens on the integer lattice, which is obtained by uh, looking at which integer numbers can be written as sum of squares up to some threshold and looking at how that changes as the threshold goes to infinity. Now, this problem, granted, has been solved in the plane by Kuth and Katz, who obtained n over log n. Yes, there's a little bit of a difference here of a square root, but it has a right dependence on the n, so it's solved for all practical purposes. But this problem has been very influential and it's open in higher dimension and has many derivative questions that are also extremely interesting in their own right. Uh, and this question motivates a question in geometric measure theory, the so-called Falconer distance problem. Now it considers a set E, which now need not anymore just have finitely many points, and it considers the what is called the distance set which is just recording the distinct distances as before, because set notation does not care about repetitions. Now, if your set E generically has infinitely many points, then this distance set will be infinite. So somehow you need to turn the Erdős distance question a little bit on its head. Instead of starting with n points and asking how many distinct distances you have, you flip it on its head and say, I would like lots of distinct distances. How many points do I need to guarantee? And when you've taken that viewpoint, then you look at this and you say, OK, OK. How do we measure whether this is large? Well, one idea is simply to take the Lebesgue measure of this. And so you say this is large if the Lebesgue measure is positive. And then you ask, how large does the set E need to be to ensure that the Lebesgue measure here is positive? And say you choose to measure how large E is in terms of Hausdorff dimension. Now, Falconer conjectured that 
the set E could be as small as D over two. And sort of the idea here is the larger the set, the easier it is to have lots of distinct distances and therefore have the Lebesgue measure of this be positive. And this concrete threshold was really obtained through a lattice example by putting balls around lattice points, shrinking them and sort of in the limit getting sets of dimension of whatever you want, depending on how large the balls are you put around the lattice points. And one can show that, well, this distance set can't be zero if the Hausdorff dimension of the set you start with is less than d over two. Uh, so one has to have the dimension at least be d over two. What happens at the end point? I do not know. There are some uh, partial results there, uh, but the conjecture is that you can reach all the way down to d over two. Now, I don't want to go through the history of all the great achievements that have been made, but there's been a lot of progress on this recently. Falconer himself started out with a d over two plus a half, which is quite close. The current best results are roughly d over two plus a quarter. Uh, in dimension two, that's due to Gu Fiosovich Yu and Wang. In even higher dimensions is due to Du Yosevich Yu Wang and Yang. In odd dimensions, a slightly worse threshold. Uh, slightly above d over 2 plus a quarter is uh, due to Du and Zhang, uh, but these are the current best records. Now, I bring up this problem because in Falconer's original result, or the modern interpretation of it, where you obtain the threshold d over 2 plus a half, the spherical averaging operator can be made to arise very naturally. So this is another type of an example of uh, of applications of the spherical averaging operator beyond the PDE and sort of ergodic theories that, that type applications that are very classic. And so the motivation for me is that point configuration questions like the Falconer distance problem can be a rich source of motivation for operators that are interesting. And so distance is just a simple configuration taken two points, you measure the distance between them, and you can look at more complicated configurations. One example being that of triangles. You take in three points, and then you can identify what triangle corresponds to those three points by simply measuring the side lengths. It's the good old side, side, side principle from uh, way back when. And these type of configurations have been studied for decades in the discrete setting, sort of similar to the Erdős problem, and have, within the last decade, been studied significantly in the setting of the Falconer distance problems. And here's an example of how you could state a Falconer distance problem for triangles. Now, instead of just recording the distance, you record this triple, the three side lengths, okay? You think of this as being the triangle. And now, yes, you're gonna measure this set again. Now you have to use a three-dimensional little back measure. This naturally lives in 3D. And so if the three-dimensional little back measure is positive, you somehow think you've lots of triangles. And you ask, ask how large does the house or dimension of E need to be to guarantee that the three-dimensional little back measure of this is positive. This naturally, just as in the case of a distance, you were led to the spherical averaging operator. If you think about it, for a distance, if you fix a point and you look at points around it at a fixed distance, that leads naturally to a sphere. Similarly here, if you fix a point X and then look at points U and V that form a triangle of a certain type uh, with X, you are naturally led to an operator of this type, okay? And so here, u and v are points such that u, v, and u minus v form your favorite triangle. Now, to help you think about this operator a little bit more, let's uh, focus on the case of an equilateral triangle. So now all the side lengths are one. Okay. And one of the things that you can see is that this truly is a multilinear or a bilinear in this context convolution averaging operator, assuming that you've properly normalized your measure over the sort of the manifold that we saw on the previous slide. And since this is a convolution operator, then on the Fourier site, you get that it's a product of the functions times the uh, symbol, the Fourier multiplier. And so in the linear world, well, all you need is uniform decay on this simple, and you get lots of great estimates, LP improving, uh, soluble of type estimates and whatnot. Now, what is interesting here, here are two estimates 
bounds through stationary phase, which is much more complicated now, but two stationary phase estimates on this, on this uh, Fourier transform. One due to Yosevich and Lou, who was speaking here at this online workshop, and one due to myself and my graduate student, Sean Savine. And one thing to observe here is that you see the threshold d minus two over two showing up quite often. This here is a little rotation. The angle that shows up here is the angle between the two Fourier variables. Okay. Now, over here, what it tells you is, well, in this estimate, if the angle is zero, there is no decay whatsoever. With my grad student, Sean Savine, we slightly tweak this so that if the angle is zero, there is some decay, assuming your dimension is bigger, strictly bigger than two. Um, but it is much less than for a generic angle theta. And so the punchline here really is that, well, in dimension two, there just simply is not decay in certain directions in your Fourier space. And even in higher dimensions, this is very sort of non-isotropic. That is, in some directions, you have lots of good decay. In other directions, you do not have much decay. Um, there are many results on multilinear integral operators that are given by uh, symbols of this type. Um, usually, most of the standard results, black box results that you have, uh, insist on uniform decay here. And so this is an example of a geometric averaging operator where you do not have uniform decay, and that makes it really interesting. Now, in work on these Falconer type problems, then in, in that context, then Greenleaf and Yosevich proved some estimates for this operator in 2D, which were then extended into higher dimensions uh, by them, along with myself and Lucas Grafagos. Um, these were LP improving in some sense, but these are negative solid spaces. So on the right hand side, uh, you should think of their LP improving because they have zero derivatives, but they hold their exponents, but they're only for non negative functions. These were really special sort of estimates, very sort of ad hoc for what was going on here. But the punchline was that they led to uh, Falconer type theorems for triangles. Now, more recently with my graduate student, Sean Samin, we looked at this operator again and really tackled it from the perspective that you saw early on in the story from the spherical, multilinear spherical averaging operators, where we uh, looked at just the symbol and just did a decomposition in Fourier space that was based on the decay properties of the symbol that you had. So in fact, we could have written down a theorem that was not just for the triangle averaging operator, it was for any kind of averaging operator that had the right kind of Fourier decay. That, th those were the only inputs that we used. But with this, we were able to get non-trivial results. See, within the Banach setting, then most results are kind of trivial, but we were able to push beyond the Banach setting. Uh, point being here, that the inputs here are slightly below L2, so we had slightly below L2 times slightly below L2, and that yields in your holder exponent something, an output function that is in slightly below L1, okay? Now, these were first types of results, intricate Fourier decompositions. Now, just as in the story with the spherical averaging operators, then exploiting more the structure of the operator, writing this, the, the measure down as a nested sort of level of measures, then Cook, Lyle, and Mauger were in fact able to handle not just the averaging operator like Sean and I were able to do, but they dealt with the maximal variance and one can also deduce uh, theorems both about uh, LP improving properties and so forth from the results. Okay, where they've got a much larger sort of range. However, unlike the story with the uh, spherical averaging operators, multilinear ones, then this did not finish the problem. Their results are best in high dimensions, and even in any kind of a high dimension, you don't get the full range that you might perhaps expect, so there are lots of open questions here. Now, some we're coming back to the averaging operators that are moving away from the maximal variant that they were studying. And so in upcoming work with Alex Yosevich and Sean, we have some LP improving estimates, improved Bonnach range uh, statements, some of which are sharp, not all of them. So some interesting new theorems coming up. 
but I just wanted to showcase this as an example about geometric averaging operators that come from point configurations where it is really interesting to study these analogs of what is happening in the linear world and so many more interesting things that we can ask here, sparse bounds, uh, what happens if you restrict to more thinner sets, all sorts of interesting questions. But I think that's a good place to stop. Here's some information about me if you want to look me up and my papers and or shoot me an email. Thank you for listening to this talk.